Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the beautiful headquarters of the Lowy Institute here at 31 Bly Street for this special address by the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, the Honourable Chris Bowen, MP. As you can see, Chris, we have a full house here at Bly Street tonight and we've been turning people away. There's a huge amount of interest in this speech. Before we begin, let me acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Ladies and gentlemen, everywhere we look, we see challenges to the global order, from Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine to Hamas's ghastly attack of October the 7th and all that has followed to China's assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific. And all the while, of course, while those uh, issues are rightly attracting our attention, the planet continues to heat up. We know that unchecked climate change will be disastrous for the earth and for humanity. Already we are confronted by the consequences of climate change, more frequent and severe tropical cyclones in the Pacific, wildfires and floods in Europe and Asia. Here in Australia, we see more extreme weather events, more droughts and flooding rains. Next week, ministers from around the world will convene in Dubai for the 28th Conference of the Parties. Their goal is to find ways to reduce global carbon emissions to limit dangerous global warming. And Australia's delegation at Dubai will be led by the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Chris Bowen. Since its election in May last year, the Albanese government has brought new momentum and energy to the issue of climate change, including a legislated commitment to cut carbon emissions and achieve net zero emissions. Last week, it signed an historic agreement with Tuvalu, the Fale Pili Union. This treaty, the first of its kind, will allow Tuvaluans affected by rising sea levels to settle in Australia. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Many of these efforts have been led by Chris Bowen. Chris entered parliament in 2007. Since then, he's held a number of important portfolios including immigration and the Treasury. Since June 2022, he served as the Climate Change and Energy Minister. I've known Chris since university, which was back in the time of the Ming Dynasty or thereabouts, I would say. Uh, Chris is a student of politics and adherent to the idea of politics as a vocation and a believer in the idea that politics can change things. I'm grateful that he's accepted my invitation to come to Bly Street tonight to set out Australia's priorities in the lead up to the Conference of the Parties. Minister, the lectern is yours. As we gather tonight on Gadigal land and acknowledge the elders of our First Peoples, let us also acknowledge a fundamental truth that our First Nations people, who enjoy such a rich and meaningful connection with their country, have much to lose from unchecked climate change. But there's another truth as well. That is that this energy transition can be one of the elements of closing the gap of Indigenous disadvantage in our country. I've been thinking a lot about this in recent weeks as we consider the way forward for reconciliation in our country. I recently received a visit from a delegation of Canadian First Peoples. Did you know that in Canada, fully 20% of renewable energy initiatives are in First Nations ownership, providing income and employment for Canadian Canadian First Peoples. I've been discussing this with my Canadian counterpart and friend, Stephen Gabot, and with our own First Nations Clean Energy Network, which our government established. In so many ways, getting this energy transition right is the key to our country's economic prosperity. But I think getting First Nations involvement right in renewable energy can play a big role in the future economic health of Australia's Indigenous peoples. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. It's far from my first speech to the Lowy Institute, but it does happen to be my first as Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Michael, thank you for your invitation to address the Institute. Uh, Ever since we met as Sydney University students 30 years ago, uh, Michael's been a good friend. He was a deep thinker then, and he's one of our country's leading thinkers today. And for the past 20 years, the Lowy Institute has admirably shaped major conversations around foreign policy, Australia's place in the world, driving bipartisan 
and thought-provoking analysis. So congratulations to Lowe Institute on your 20-year milestone. We came to government with a big agenda to drive the domestic energy transformation, to lift our climate ambition and put the nation on a new trajectory, to provide new leadership at home and abroad, to turn our country's climate policy from an international embarrassment into a means of international engagement, to capitalise on the best comparative advantage our country has ever been gifted, and to make our country a renewable energy superpower. We've made a good start, but the job is far from over. I'm pleased with the progress we've made so far, but far from satisfied. In the first weeks of the Albanese government, the Prime Minister and I wrote to the UNFCCC with Australia's updated NDC and 2030 target, a lift from 26 to 28% up to 43%. We were joined at that signing ceremony by representatives of the business community, the trade union movement, energy users, energy generators, manufacturers and climate groups. Sure, this was symbolism, but it was important symbolism. I think it sent several messages that the broad swathe of Australians wanted the climate wars to end. That not only had the government of Australia changed, but Australia had changed. And that we are all in on action on climate change. Business, unions, climate groups, all in. The makers and users of energy united on working on this most important economic transition. United as we must be. Now much has happened since, and I won't be detaining you tonight with a detailed summary of our climate policy achievements over the last 18 months, but it's been a very busy period. My friend James Shaw, the outgoing New Zealand's Minister for Climate Change, was kind enough to recently observe, in his opinion, that the Albanese government did more in its first 12 months on climate policy than the Ardern government did in five years. This includes the passage of the Climate Change Act and shining our targets into law to send a message to renewable energy investors around the world that we are a stable and welcoming policy environment. The Act also enshrined the annual climate change statement to Parliament, and I'll be making the second such statement next week, updating the Parliament and the nation on progress, obstacles and the way forward in an open and transparent manner, being straight about the challenges as well as the opportunities. And we've reformed the safeguard mechanism, delivering real and meaningful emissions reductions from our industrial sector in a way which encourages ongoing industrial and economic resilience in Australia. I've been pleased that since we passed those reforms, major industrial powerhouses committed to decarbonisation. Orica and Bluescope have announced investments in Australian manufacturing worth billions of dollars and have cited the policy certainty created by our, our reforms as essential for making those investments. The key to our targets and policies, and that each one, as far as I'm concerned, that we consider has to meet, is a twin test. They must be ambitious and achievable. We need to stretch our country's efforts, but this ambition needs to be considered in the context of a deep understanding of our economic strengths, challenges and opportunities. And our current targets are not without challenges. That's because they're ambitious. They are meant to stretch, but they're ambitious with enormous dividends. Cleaner, cheaper, more reliable energy into the domestic grid, capitalising on the jobs and investment inherent in the net zero transformation, delivering real emissions reductions for future generations at home and abroad. And of course, the case for urgency and action is strong. In 2023, Australia had already seen, has already seen devastating bushfires across multiple states before we even hit summer. In Queensland, more homes have already burnt in the state this year than during the 2019-2020 black summer. In southern Queensland, October brought the third highest number of daytime hotspots seen this century, trends detected by heat sensing satellites that show fire activity. And at the peak of these fires did not ease at night. Five times more nighttime hotspots than average have been detected compared to previous Octobers. Not only are we seeing hotter and drier conditions this summer, but we're seeing it around the clock, leaving our firefighters and emergency services increasingly stretched. And this mirrors, of course, what we're seeing globally. Last week, the medical journal The Lancet issued their eighth countdown report monitoring the impacts of climate change on health and productivity. 2023, uh, 
witnessed the world seeing the highest global temperatures in over 100,000 years and heat records that were broken in all continents through 2022. Adults older than 65 and infants younger than one year for whom extreme heat can be particularly life-threatening are now exposed to twice as many heatwave days as they would have experienced in the period 1986 to 2005. We can't ignore these realities and indeed we need to stay the course both domestically and internationally. So with this in mind, tonight I want to discuss our international climate position 18 months into government including our domestic agenda which is critical to establishing credibility and ensuring Australians benefit from the net zero transition, establishing our nation as a renewable energy superpower and the international climate reset we've seen since we were elected. I'll also give an update on some of the key issues leading, uh, leading into COP28 for Australia. One of the key pillars of our energy plan is of course the target of 82% renewables by 2030, up from around 33% when we came to government. This is no small challenge. It'll see us almost triple the share of renewables in our grid. It requires growing and modernising our transmission and distribution infrastructure, a considerable undertaking in the vast nation of large distances like Australia. And despite what some detractors may say, it's actually in line with like-minded countries and with global trends. The International Energy Agency's latest renewable energy analysis shows global renewable capacity is expected to increase by almost 2,400 gigawatts. That's almost 75% between 2022 and 2027. In 2023, global investment in solar power is set to eclipse oil investment for the first time ever. Renewable energy capacity in the United States is forecast to increase 75% or over 280 gigawatts from 2022 to 2027, in line with their target of 100% carbon pollution free electricity by 2035. Canada's aim is 90% renewable and zero emissions energy by 2030 and 100% by 2035. Ireland's National Development Plan increased the targeted share of renewables in electricity consumption to 80% by 2030. And in Italy, the Ministry of Ecological Transition has proposed increasing the share of renewable electricity to 72%. Germany raised its 2030 target from 65% to 80% and accelerated the pace of solar PV and wind expansion by 2030. So the point I'm making is that our plans are ambitious but in line with global trends and it's critical that we maintain the course. It's critical for, critical for costs, critical for reliability and critical for energy security. 82% will deliver cheaper, cleaner, more reliable energy for Australians. We know renewable energy is cheaper. Australians with solar panels know that. Australian households are saving up to 57% on their energy bills if they have rooftop solar installed. They're also cleaner, critical to achieving our emissions reduction task. But increasing renewables in our grid is also vital for reliability and for energy security. In 2022, Australia's coal-fired power fleet suffered thousands of hours of forced outages, leaving the grid short of forecast coal generation capacity for nearly a quarter of the year. Expert analysis of coal plant performance finds that the units are collectively unavailable for a much longer period or volume of energy than was the case several years ago. Now, this isn't a political view, it's a practical reality and reinforces the urgency of the transition to renewables. The importance of our plan to get to 82% for affordability, for cleaner energy and for reliability. The other, over, the other overlooked fact about renewable energy is that it provides us with a strategic advantage when it comes to energy security. We have an abundance of wind and solar resources, enough to power our economy several times over. We receive 58 million petajoules of solar radiation a year, 10,000 times more than we need. The ongoing geopolitical circumstances just reinforce the view that these resources are important. The COVID-19 pandemic reminded us of the need to ensure protection against vulnerable global supply chains. The war in Ukraine has had a devastating impact on energy security with much of Europe held ransom uh, to the supply of resources from Russia. And we have seen how this European energy supply crisis has cascaded across the world, highlighting the flaws in energy security reliance on concentrated fossil fuel supply chains. But there's no geopolitical crisis which can stop the flow of sunshine to our land or can stop the wind blowing on or off our shore. Last month, the International Energy Agency released the 2023 World Energy Outlook with energy security as a central theme. As the report says, the Russian invasion has shown, and I quote, 
domestically produced clean energy can clearly be an asset at times of geopolitical stress. And there's no nation better set up to take advantage of this than Australia. Of course, a reliable renewable system must be buttressed with robust storage, transmission, and where possible, sovereign domestic manufacturing of the key elements of the renewable supply chain. And that's exactly what our policies are designed to achieve. Reducing reliance on and exposure to international fossil fuel headwinds is good for domestic energy security, and our plans to transform our energy grid to 82% renewable energy is essential for both this and energy reliability. Secondly, setting our nation up as a renewable energy superpower will be critical to our continued future as a reliable energy supplier to the world and as a key driver to our domestic and international conversations. Properly managed, this is a win-win. Our domestic decarbonisation efforts are important, but they pale in comparison to the emissions reduction achieved if we're able to harness and export our renewable energy to help countries who don't have the abundant renewable resources that we have. And of course, the economic dividend for our country is enormous. Across green hydrogen and ammonia, green metals, refined critical minerals and clean technology manufacturing, including battery and supply chains. Our fundamental comparative advantage in the future is our renewable energy potential. Our tremendous solar radiation and wind resources can provide the basis for industries powered by cleaner, cheaper energy. Our 82% target is critical for laying down the foundations of our superpower plan. But it doesn't stop with 82%, which is why we're developing our sectoral plans to set us on the journey to net zero emissions. These are critical to our renewable superpower ambitions for two reasons, underpinned by a basic reciprocity. One, we know that we need to mobilise and attract significant global capital to achieve these ambitions, and having a clearly articulated plan for the transition is no longer optional, but a baseline expectation of capital markets. Two, we will achieve both goals, net zero emissions and the development of new export opportunities, far more efficiently by working on shared challenges with our trading partners. Just as our historically prosperous industries have developed through the exchange of capital and knowledge between Australia and our trading partners, so too will new clean energy industries be built in partnership with these countries, with Australians benefiting from the upside of jobs and investment that this will generate. Whether this is INEOS's investment in renewable hydrogen in Queensland or POSCO's plans to invest massive amounts in renewable hydrogen and green iron production in the Pilbara, these international partnerships will underpin our shared domestic and regional prosperity as the world decarbonises. We continue to work with the United States through our historic climate critical minerals and clean energy transformation compact to harness the opportunities for Australia. The agreement between President Biden and Prime Minister Albanese to make climate and clean energy the third pillar of the alliance was no small thing. Energy Secretary Granholm and I have already had several conversations about the operalisation of this agreement and there were further announcements on the practical work Australia and United State, States will do together during the Prime Minister's recent visit. Australia's net zero commitment and renewable superpower ambition are the twin engines in the government's plan to harness the opportunities of the global energy transformation. Our approach is ambitious seeking to play to our strengths and position Australia's economy to capitalise on the opportunities as our trading partners decarbonising. Over 97% of our exports go to destinations with net zero commitments. But as well as cultivating our international partnerships, this vision also includes backing Australian businesses to become a bigger part of the energy transition, both here and abroad. This means backing the industries that are key to our renewable superpower ambitions by supporting their ability to play to their strengths. Whether it's HiSATA building a game-changing electrolyzer technology in Illawarra, or SunDrive manufacturing high energy efficient solar cells in Australia, the government is supporting ambitious Australian manufacturers to go big and to do so here. This helps us achieve our targets, diversify supply chains, and is supporting new jobs and opportunities in our regions as well. It's about developing long-term competitiveness through clean energy while maximising the benefits of our energy transition to our economic security, resilience and to our strategic interests, to our people and to our regions. In the last few weeks, we've seen Quinbrook Infrastructure Partners planning to build a solar polysilicon plant in Queensland to supply international solar panel manufacturers looking to diversify their supply chains. This major plant is being considered for Townsville and it will be amongst the first in the world to rely heavily on renewable energy in the manufacturing process. 
Attracting investors like Quinbrook is possible when we have the fundamental comparative advantages, but to attract many more, we need to have clear and active industry policy and a stable investment environment. The challenges of this task we've set ourselves are self-evident. We're competing for finite resources in a tight global supply chain, whether it's wind turbine components or electrolyzers. We're going to have to grow the clean energy workforce by many thousands. One example, we need 32,000 more electricians between now and 2030. That's a lot of electricians in a short time. These challenges can't be ignored and can't be overcome by sitting on the sidelines. Ultimately, we're also competing for global capital and our superpower plan is our best asset in this race. A clearly articulated, ambitious plan to become a renewable energy superpower by leveraging our trading and investment relationships and backing our innovative clean energy businesses is a crucial sign to the world that Australia is open for business. Now, of course, none of this ambition and domestic action comes in a vacuum. In no small way, modern foreign policy and climate policy are intrinsically linked. The combination of increased climate change ambition and a genuine willingness to engage with like-minded nations, reprising our role as a member of the Pacific family and our responsibility to represent our region, has seen Australia emerge from being a reluctant spectator internationally and often a detractor in international discussions to a constructive interlocutor and more than that, to a nation willing to play a role in keeping with our ambitions for ourselves and our region. The Indo-Pacific counts for more than half of the world's energy consumption and emissions. And the region's confronting very real impacts, as we know. Nowhere is the climate threat more profound than in the Pacific, with Kiribati, Tuvalu and the Marshall Islands only a few metres above sea levels above the sea level. The australia tuvalu Falapilli Union, signed by the Prime Ministers Albanese and Natano, shows what practical but ambitious leadership looks like. Where Australia has answered a request from Tuvalu to help safeguard its future through a special mobility pathway and a security commitment, while also boosting our assistance for Tuvalu's adaptation and coastal resilience. And of course, we put forward our bid to host COP31 in partnership with the Pacific, to elevate Pacific voices and experiences in international climate discussions. Being back at the table enables us to advocate and advance our region's interests, while promoting our domestic agenda and building stronger economic links through partnerships and cooperation. In just over a week's time, we'll again be playing a role at COP. Last year, I was pleased to be asked by the COP president to co-chair the negotiations on climate finance. It was the first time Australia had been asked to play such a role in a decade. Having not been asked to play such a role in 10 years, we've now been asked twice in a row. The COP president, Dr Sultan al Jeba, has asked Australia to co-chair the discussions on adaptation. And I've asked my friend and colleague, Assistant Minister Jenny McAllister, to undertake this role, and she'll do it very well. Now, it's fair to say that some have become disillusioned not only about the role of COP, but about the ability of multilateral forums to progress substantial change. And I understand. For example, in July, I travelled to India to represent Australia in both the energy and environment G20 ministerials. Fine and flowery speeches in the plenary sessions were not backed up with ambition and intent behind closed doors negotiations. The negotiations based on consensus means that, as they are in both the COP and G20, it doesn't take much to block progress. So I don't blame those observing proceedings who will question the ability of such multilateral fora to achieve anything, while some nations are so determined to block progress. We are clear-eyed, but not disillusioned about the challenges of multilateralism, however. The fact is the change is hard. We're talking about some of the most fundamental and existential questions of international climate change and asking nations to change their economies and trajectories, and that comes with challenges. Yes, it is urgent. Yes, it is necessary. But there are plenty of challenges in the international space. 
But it's more important than ever that we stay the course, because even incremental change can make substantial progress. We need to recognise that countries will move at different paces and different paths, but the direction of travel is clear and agreed, and we need to stay the course. And hard work does make a difference. Before the Paris Accord was struck, the world was on track for 3.8 degrees of warming. It's now closer to two degrees. Too high, but better than it was. And in, in our own context, the looming Glasgow COP contributed to the maelstrom of political pressure, which saw the Morrison government finally sign up for net zero by 2050. It was the very least they could have done and was lacked detail as to the plans. But it was a step nonetheless, and a step which wouldn't have come about without international pressure through the COP. So change may be incremental, but it can add up to something substantial. The recent Sunnyland statement issued by Presidents Biden and Xi is another signal for cautious, pragmatic optimism in the lead up to COP28. The dialogue between the world's two largest economies and emitters ahead of COP28 is a positive development. And the statement does provide some reason for hope. The failure at the G20, however, provides us with caution because the Sunnyland statement shows us that it pays to keep working and that's exactly what we intend to do. Moving on to Australia's approach at COP28. One of the key outcomes of this year's conference will be the first ever global stock take, which is due to conclude in coming weeks at COP28. It intends to be a frank assessment of where the world is at. If the fires, floods and extreme conditions across the world are painting the picture of the urgency of climate action, the global stock take is the accompanying label, explaining the details of where we stand and where we need to go. I don't know what it'll say, but I don't envisage it'll be pretty reading. It will need to enhance action on the financial and technical support that we need, and it will need to drive behaviour. It will need to be, and I believe will be, a large and substantial and contested discussion. And my good friend from Denmark, Minister Dan Jorgensen, is the co-facilitator, which I'm very pleased about. The IEA's World Energy Outlook found that for the first time, peaks in global demand for coal, oil and natural gas are visible this decade. That's a good thing for the first time, thanks to the combination of the growing momentum behind clean energy technologies and structural economic shifts around the world, which has had major implications for fossil fuels. And again, Australia will be arguing for stronger mitigation language. Glasgow was a step forward. In Sharm el-Sheikh, like-minded countries tried to progress further, but we were forced to hold the line. We were spending all night just negotiating to defend the status quo from Glasgow. In Dubai, we will again be arguing for a strong position and stronger mitigation outcomes. We want this COP to be about stronger practical outcomes, not just maintaining the status quo. We'll also be supporting a tripling of global renewable capacity and a doubling of global energy efficiency efforts. Australia plays a reasonably unique role in this conversation alongside our friends from Canada, another traditional fossil fuel based economy in the middle of a major transition and arguing for progressive outcomes in international fora, we can play the role of a country that is dealing with the practical implications of this transition each and every day. This is no theoretical exercise for us. We come to the discussions not inhibited by our experience with fossil fuels, but informed by it. We come to the discussion as a nation fully seized by the opportunities of renewable energy as well. That's why our stance shouldn't be underestimated. We know the challenges, we know how hard it can be, but we come to the table with some credibility because we also know the opportunities and the imperative of action. The second major topic for discussion will be the creation of a new fund for loss and damage. Australia supported the decision at COP27 to establish new funding arrangements, including a fund for supporting particularly vulnerable and developing countries to address the loss and damage from climate impacts. We've been contributing very constructively over the last 12 months to the design of the new fund and the future funding arrangements with our representation on the Transitional Committee, which served as the drafting group and have engaged widely with Pacific countries to get it right for them as well. Our objective is to ensure that these discussions deliver practical outcomes and maximum impact for the Pacific, as well as other countries who are particularly vulnerable to climate impacts. This last point is critical and I want to spend a few moments on it. Australia is of the strong opinion that funding arrangements must deliver for the most climate vulnerable countries, drawing from a broad donor base, including private and innovative sources of finance. 
1992, the world agreed to common but differentiated responsibilities. That is to say, all countries need to act, but wealthier countries who have a greater capacity and contributed the most to emissions need to contribute more to climate action and finance. This was and is, of course, the right approach. But the world wasn't set in stone in 1992. Just because a country wasn't wealthy or wasn't a major emitter in 1992 doesn't mean the same is necessarily the case 30 years later. Nor should the contributions of countries be set in stone either. So let me be even clearer. The world has changed a lot since 1992. The list of Annex 1 countries who are required to make larger contributions to climate finance would not be the same if we were writing it today. The 2015 Paris Agreement recognised that a country's capability and emissions evolve over time, and of course they do. It makes clear that our respective responsibilities should be seen in the light of these different national circumstances. And it's time to have that discussion in a serious way. Arguing that climate finance should come from as broad a donor base as possible is about maximising the flow of funds to help the developing world deal with climate change, which is ultimately in all our interests. And just as I argued in the international edition of The Guardian with my friends, the then New Zealand Minister James Shaw and the Canadian Minister Stephen Gabot, Australia will continue to argue for a sea change in the way multilateral development banks treat climate finance with a view to leveraging multiples more of private and public investment in mitigation and adaptation. Our position at the COP comes on the back of Australia's announcement that we will rejoin the Green Climate Fund with a modest contribution to be announced before the end of the year. We'll also contribute to the new Pacific Resilience Facility, a Pacific built trust fund that will be established to invest in small scale climate and disaster resilient projects. Australia focused on delivering practical assistance to the region, delivering target funding to areas of need. That's why we've taken the road we have with our substantial contribution to the Pacific Resilience Fund. We've boosted our infrastructure investments and established a dedicated climate and infrastructure partnership to deliver climate resilient investments for the Pacific's needs. And we're now on track to deliver $3 billion towards the global uh, climate finance goal, one billion more than Australia's previous commitment. We've taken on board feedback from our partners in the Pacific on the best ways to direct climate finance efforts and ensure all, element, all elements of our efforts deliver directly for Pacific priorities. And we'll continue with this lens as discussions about financing continue. So friends, keep 1.5 Alive was the rallying call for the Glasgow COP. We shouldn't forget it at this coming COP. That's why Australia will be supportive of strong COP outcomes. Every element, every increment of a degree over 1.5 degrees of warming makes a huge difference to our planet and to the health of our people. Since May 2022, we've been restoring Australia's climate leadership at home and abroad. That's the approach we'll continue to take in Dubai in coming weeks and beyond. It's in the best interest of our country, of our region and our planet. The stakes are high, but so is our determination. Thank you very much. Minister, thank you for paying us the compliment of giving a really substantive speech, one that will be picked over, I'm sure, in the media tonight and tomorrow and will be read closely by your counterparts as they prepare to assemble in Dubai. I want to only ask you a few questions because I know there's a lot of people in the audience who want to direct questions to you. Um, let me ask you first about your Australia's ambition to become a renewable energy superpower. As you said, um, while domestic decarbonisation is important, there are even more, far more significant emissions reductions to flow if we can export renewable energy to help other countries decarbonise. We know that Australia has access to vast um, renewable energy resources, but what will it really take to secure our position in a competitive global marketplace, given that other much larger countries are investing hundreds of billions of dollars to try to dominate these industries? Where are we best placed to lead? What are the best things we have going for us? Well, the best things we have going for us are our people, our room. One thing renewable energy takes is space. We have plenty of that. Uh, and as I said, our, our renewable energy resources, more sunlight hits our country than any other country in the world. And we have the second best wind resources of any continent, if you count us as a continent, in the world. 
after Antarctica, it's a bit hard to build wind farms there. So um, we have massive opportunities. What we lack is capital. Uh, and we need, we've always been capital hungry, as you know, since 1788. And that'll, that problem will get just more acute as we need more investment. Now, the good news is, um, I've just come from another event where there was a chief executive of a major renewable energy company. He said Australia is the key market in the world for him at the moment. And that is a common story. So I meet with the chairs or chief executives of all the big renewable firms around the world when they come to Australia, and it's, and it's been a bit of a revolving door in recent months, and that's a very good thing. And they all say to me, Australia's number one or in the top three or four for, for them for investment. Now, I want to see that pipeline transition to FID. I want to see that transition to construction. And, you know, there's, there's plenty of uh, things that we need to work on to make that a reality. So our planning system, for example, we are managing strength in some instances, our renewable energy um, applications under the EPBC Act, the Federal Approval Act, have gone up 20%. That's a good thing. It means, it means the department is grappling with um, the workload, which we need to deal with, um, but it's managing strength. So I really think it's, Michael, taking our natural advantages and, tra and translating that to a stable and welcoming policy environment, which we are doing and we need to do more of, and continue to the ever receding finishing line, uh, and to take what is, as I said, as I referred to or intimated there, we've been in search of comparative advantage you know, since all through modern history. We've never been granted one like this before, and we have to seize it. All right, let me ask you about the COP. Um, you, had, you said, uh, to quote you in your speech, that we've seen many fine and flowery speeches in recent years, but they haven't translated into ambition and intent when it comes to the closed door discussions and, and the decisions. And yet you sounded quite positive about the prospects for real progress at the COP. Why? Why are you so positive? Well, well, we'll see because, I mean, I choose to be positive because it beats the alternative, but um, it gets me out of bed to, you know, to do the one o'clock in the morning calls with my international counterparts in the lead up to COP to say, well, we have to make this work. Um, I, I do seriously take some heart from the Sunny Lands Agreement. I think, I think that is, you know, that's a big deal. Even a small deal can be a big deal when it's the United States and China working together on a on a on a thing like climate change. So that gives me heart. Uh, but it will be will be hard. Um, the G20 was was very hard work. And my point about fine and flowery speeches is one I made in the plenary session, uh, and I took an Australian an Australian perspective to say, you know, we're going around the room of all the ministers giving our G20 contributions. We're all saying, you know, how important it is that we all come together and act and I said, this is all very well, but your negotiators downstairs are blocking progress. You can't give a flowery speech up here and instruct your negotiators to block progress downstairs. My friend, the Canadian minister sitting next to me, went after me and said, I can't be as blunt as Australia, but I agree with him. Um, <laughs> so uh, that, that, that's the sort of, in, in, a, in, a, in an environment where the geopolitical environment has gotten worse since the last COP. I mean, the worst last COP we were dealing with Ukraine, and now we're obviously dealing with the Middle East as well. So the geopolitical, just general, vibe mm. has made those discussions harder. I will say um, one of the reasons I have some confidence is that the COP president, Sultan al is doing a good job. I know his appointment was controversial and I know not everybody saw it that way, but I call it as I see it. And he's constantly on the phone to me. He's constantly sending um, text messages. What, how can we work on this issue? What do you suggest we do about that? How can we work the Pacific on this? That's a very active COP president. And he really wants a good outcome. So um, uh, he'll be working very hard and we'll be giving whatever support we can in leading the discussions for a good outcome. And we'll see, look, it might, it might not work, but we can leave nothing on the field. All right. Finally, let me ask you about loss and damage and differentiated responsibilities because you used some very interesting language today. You said the world wasn't set in stone in 1992. The world has changed. And so the list of countries who... Um, receive contributions to assist in combating climate change and those who make contributions are not set in stone either. You said it's time to have a discussion about changing responsibilities. 
Tell us a little bit more about that. Are you talking about countries like China, Saudi Arabia, Brazil? These are the kinds of countries. How big a deal is this? How important is this? I think, I think it's an important conversation. Um, you can go through the list of countries who were poor in 1992 and are not poor now. And, you know, you've mentioned some of them and there'll be a few others. Um, it's important for a couple of reasons, Michael. One, because it is about maximising the flow of funds to vulnerable countries. You know, if you've got countries that are now rich who are sitting on the sidelines and not putting into these funds, then the funds aren't going to be as big. It's as simple as that. Um, it's also, frankly, about um, in developed countries winning community support. We saw when I supported the loss and damage um, proposals at COP, um, questions being asked in Parliament by the opposition to say, why is Australia doing this? You know, I had to answer questions when I got back saying, how could you possibly sign a blank check to China? You know, which was, of course, not what it was about. But if you're going to bring um, communities with you and explain, you know, this is really important because you've got these very vulnerable countries here who are really up against it and they're very in need of support. It's a, it's a legitimate question for taxpayers, whether they be in Australia, the United States, United Kingdom, or Canada, or Germany, or Japan, to ask, well, hang on, all right, but if we're putting in, why are those countries? And if you're really going to make this case, then I think you have to have an answer to that. So it's a, it's a, it's a, multi, it's a, it's, it's a multifaceted problem, but the solution does lead me on all, on all those issues to say, well, it's time to have that conversation seriously. All right, it's time for me to take some audience questions. Uh, I can see one of my colleagues here. I'm going to ask uh, people, participants to wait for the microphone and then just give us your name and any affiliation you'd like to mention and then ask a short question, please. Michelle. Hi, um, I'm Michelle Lyons. I'm a Climate Change Research Fellow at the Lowy Institute. Minister, thank you for a really detailed um, and candid speech. Um, now, you very powerfully advocated for reforms of the multilateral uh, development banks uh, and um, that, that advocated for Australia to be a, a progressive partner um, in, in advancing those reforms. But progress has been very slow, as you also noted, uh, and there is a, a real sort of uh, imperative to act quickly with the rising emissions levels around the world. So I was interested uh, in your views on what is the way forward and um, between those two tensions, and is there broader, are there broader changes that are needed to the international uh, sort of financial architecture to accelerate uh, investment uh, to, in the transition to net zero emissions? Um. Uh, I, I think it, thank you for the question. I think, it, yes, we do need to more, do more and, and do more faster. It varies from MDB to MDB. I mean, the World Bank, I'll be typically Australian, you know, in Australian fashion, blunt with you, has been appalling in the past, but a big step forward with the appointment of the new president. Now, he has not yet been able to turn the entire ship around, but I, I have confidence uh, that he will do good things. The... Um, uh, ADB, the Asian Development Bank, on the other hand, has done a good job all the way through, to their great credit, um, and a pretty good model for others to look at. Um, so there's much to do. It's not going to be the same for every MDB either. You know, they, they do have different roles, um, but we as shareholders and members of the board and stakeholders have to be just pushing for more action. Um, I think there's an issue around you know what developed countries can do with you know. Um, currency risk and etc. Which isn't, there's no easy answer, but um, there are some interesting ideas out there as to what might be able to be done uh, across the board. Uh, but ultimately, money doesn't solve all the problems. Without money, we're not going to solve any problems. It's very expensive. It's very expensive. Increasingly, I mean, the focus has to be on adaptation. This is the other thing. MDBs need to focus more on adaptation. As much as strongly and passionately as I believe in mitigation, I do I hope that comes through. The fact is we've left it too late and we're going to have to focus a lot of effort on adaptation for, for uh, particularly vulnerable island states. All right, in the front row, we have a question and then I see a gentleman towards the back. Minister, first of all, thank you for moving the agenda, finally. Much appreciated. I'm Vic Bansell, I'm CEO of Bottle. Um, one of the things I'm really keen to hear is, is CBAM on the agenda at COP? or is it all countries looking at it separately? 
just love to hear your views, please. Oh, the answer is, Vic, that all countries are looking at it separately. It's not a COP uh, matter. It may come up in bilateral conversations. Um, uh, the only place where it really does get discussed in a multilateral or a, or a semi-multilateral forum is the Climate Club, which we joined recently, um, which is not about a common sort of approach, but it is about trying to get complementary approaches. As you know, we are looking at this issue in Australia. Uh, we, I've begun that process. Uh, I, now that we have a decent climate and carbon policy in Australia with the safeguards reforms, it's time to look at carbon leakage. There was no point looking at it in the past. Now that we actually have a decent policy, it's time to look at how we best avoid leakage. CBAM is a very strong contender in that conversation. I've asked Professor Frank Jotso, who's a professor of climate economics at the ANU, to lead that work within my department. So it's, I wanted my department's doing good work on it, but I wanted a fresh set of eyes to come in. And so Frank is leading that work. He's been in Europe consulting. It's a very technical piece of work and complicated. It took Europe seven years to write their CBAM. Um, I don't want to particularly take that long, but nor am I going to rush, you know, because it is a highly um, technical piece of work and the implications of getting it wrong are significant. So we will get it right, but it's a, it's a, it's a matter for Australia. It's not a matter that gets discussed um, in multilateral fora. Thank you. I saw a gentleman, yes, with his hand up in the aisle. Hello, uh, Minister Peter Hannum from The Guardian, and uh, look forward to the next... Uh, commentary from you, perhaps with a nice big exclusive embedded for The Guardian. Um, <clears throat> anyway, always be question, selling, uh, mm. always be selling. Mm. Yeah, can't help it. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned that um, it's important for economies uh, to change and you know, trajectories to change. I'm just wondering, at COP, uh, how difficult is it for Australia, if you like, to conjole other countries uh, to change course if we're going to continue to approve new gas and coal projects. Um, and look, a second question, uh, you probably won't want to comment on the origin takeover, but if it does, fall, does fall over this week, um, what role would you like to see super funds play, given that we have such a huge uh, resource base in that uh, energy transition? Thanks. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, on the first question, I mean, we can talk about coal and gas and its role, uh, and I spoke about that in a speech in Perth last week, for example. I mean, we're going to get to 82% renewables, which is a big lift, but that still leaves 18% fossil fuels in our grid, and gas use is coming down, and gas supply is coming down faster. I.e., oh, yeah, we have a shortfall in 2026, 27. And if you're going to deal with that shortfall, you're going to need to fill the gap. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important part of the transition. And gas, as you know, is a flexible fuel. So it's, it's pretty fundamental to underpinning renewable energy because you can turn a gas-fired power station off and on with two minutes' notice. That's pretty handy for Daniel Westerman and AEMO in an 82% grid. You can't do that with coal and you can't do that with nuclear. And therefore, you need to ensure supply of gas to those gas-fired power stations. And at the moment, we have a problem in 2026, 2027, which needs to be filled. Um, your question about how it plays in international fields, I've got to say... Uh, it's a very important debate and argument. Uh, every, no other country raises it um, in my discussions. Um, obviously, the Pacific has, you know, that they, they have a, a well-known position. But when I go and meet with Germany or Japan or anybody else, they, compl they, they are all dealing with very similar issues. Australia's credibility in the international discussions is very, very, very high because they see what we're doing and dealing with. Um, and... Um, I don't see it in the same frame that you put it forward in. Uh, in terms of the, you're right, I, obviously I can't comment on the origin takeover other than to say I welcome, as I've said, all foreign investment in renewable energy in, in Australia that's properly constructed. And, um, you know, I, I very warmly uh, appreciate the interest uh, in Australia. Matter for shareholders, I'm not one. Um, and so it's over to them. In terms of the role of superannuation, I, I Against the test that superannuation funds must always act in their members' best interests, of course, there's a huge pool of capital there, and I'd love to see it more deployed in renewable energy, but they've got to meet the tests of it being in the best interests of their members. It's, this, it's called the sole purpose test for a reason, because it's the sole purpose. Um, but it can be ticked and also heavily investing in Australia's energy transition. 
All right. Um, who else would? Yes, I'll take a question here from this gentleman. Thank you, Minister Bowen. Um, it's good to see uh, the ambition. Um, I'm Lachlan from Brambles. We're a supply chain logistics company. Um, talking with a lot of our peers um, who also have very ambitious um, decarbonisation and sustainability agendas, You've spoken a lot about stationary energy and the urgency there, which is important, um, but a lot of uh, the carbon that's tied up in supply chains is, is a real focus. And, uh, and I was wondering if, there, the, if you, you could talk to the coordination of the sectorial decarbonisation programs you mentioned earlier with uh, sectors like heavy transport, uh, freight transport, and also do you see a role for sustainable plantation uh, forestry to play a role in adaption in land use sectoral decarbonisation? Uh, so thank you. So we are writing six sectoral plans. Um, I'm the co-author of all of them. So uh, I write them in conjunction with the relevant minister. So the industry plan is me and Ed Husick, the transport plan is me and Catherine King, the resources plan is me and Madeline King, etc. cetera. Um, so there will be, you know, my job is to basically make sure they all come together in a coherent fashion and they feed into our 2035 target, which the cabinet. Uh, will determine on my recommendation in due course. Um, they're all important because they really were suggested to me by investors to say, we need to know what the government thinks is the pathway in each sector. And I sort of tested that a bit with the investors and say, well, you're the guys investing hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, surely you know. And they said, yeah, but we really want to know what you think so that we can, that helps us guide. So that's where the sector plans came from. Um, and they're all important. They will deal with some of the harder edge sectors. So for example, transport, you mentioned, you're pretty right. Light vehicles, we know what to do basically. You know, we've cut the taxes on electric vehicles. It's seen EV sales move from 2% when we came to office to closer to 9% today. That's good, not yet good enough, but good. Pretty big jump in 18 months. We're gonna do fuel efficiency standards. That's important. Heavy vehicles is a more complicated nut to crack. Has to be cracked. Not a, not as not as simple as equation as I mean I don't want to make I don't want you to think that light vehicles is simple but it's simpler than heavy vehicles, you know the right mix between electric and hydrogen, um, the right incentives, the right the right balance to strike. So that's where the sector plan will really nut some of those issues through, um, and after heavy consultation work with the sector, um, you talked about plantations. Well, one of the issues is that clearly biofuels are going to play a bigger role in some form, not just in transport but in industry. And how do we ensure feedstock um, is something that we need to continue to consider and work with the sector on. Um, it is We have lots of feedstock in Australia, but true decarbonisation requires a lot of feedstock as well. So um, they're the sorts of issues that the sector plans would look at, yes. In the second row, another of my colleagues from the Lowy Institute. Thank you. Uh, Georgia Hammersley, also from the Lowy Institute. Uh, thank you for your address, Minister. Um, you mentioned the recent announcement that Australia would rejoin the UN's Green Climate Fund. Um, and so my question is, beyond a financial contribution to the fund, and given that Australia previously held a seat on the board, what are the opportunities now for Australia to support the Pacific, access more financing from the GCF, which is a challenge that the region continues to face? It's a great question, Georgia. And I've got to say the decision to rejoin the Green Climate Fund was not a no-brainer. It might appear a no-brainer, but when we were considering it, it was not a simple, you know, 90-10 judgment call. It was much closer to a 60-40 judgment call because the Green Climate Fund has not done a good job for the Pacific. And so therefore, it's a very genuine question to say, well, why would we rejoin if it's not doing a good job in the region that we are so focused on? I actually consulted with Pacific ministers before making the decision, Pacific climate ministers. You know, we've got to make a decision about the Green Climate Fund. Should we rejoin or not? It was a finely balanced piece of advice from them too. On balance, the request from them was, please rejoin to try and get a seat at the table to try and make them better. And that had a lot of weight with me and with Minister Wong and with the Cabinet. And um, the sort the problems that the Pacific have, they say that the Green Climate Fund is very difficult to navigate, very difficult to comply with their onerous sort of 
paperwork, etc. Now, we are talking about very big amounts of money and there's always going to be requirements on transparency and accountability. Everybody accepts that. But it's just not working. Has it been working for the Pacific? So we've rejoined with a view to taking a step back in. They know the Green Climate Fund. No, I mean, I had a Teams meeting with the Executive Director of the Green Climate Fund and at the point where I could say, I do not know whether we're going to rejoin or not, but I'm telling you the one thing holding us back is your lack of uh, progress in the Pacific. So I couldn't have been franker. And she outlined all their plans for the Pacific and how they try and lift their game and they know it's an issue. And again, they had some weight with us as well. And I said to her, if we rejoin, this is not going to be the last conversation we have about the Pacific. Um, now, again, they're trying. I know it's complicated, but that was the sort of thought process that we went through. We also took the decision, as I said, to fund the Pacific Resilience Facility because that is direct support for the region we are most focused on and we know it will go directly to them. And so that is where our effort is focused in the shorter term. Uh, but we want to be back at the table of the Green Climate Fund to at least be a participant in the conversation about how they interact with the Pacific. As you know, Minister, there was also a very fine Lowy Institute paper arguing mm. that on balance uh, Australia should... I did. I should have mentioned it. I did read it uh, during, the, during the considerations and it did have some bearing on those considerations. Yeah, I, I think we've proved our policy impact. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> um, all right. Any... Yes, I'll take a question from the lady there with a the hand up. <coughs> Um, Sally Torgerman, KPMG. Um, Minister, thank you for your refreshing comments. I think it's really insightful um, just how much um, you have to cover in this in this portfolio. Um, and just to take your leave on being blunt, uh, with only three renewable projects reaching financial close this year, um, it's probably fair to say that's not our best year yet, um, despite all the good work being done. Uh, many challenges being raised being supply chain, one of them, of course, but um, obviously the one that's really hurting this year is the increased cost of CapEx. Um, what role do you see investors playing in, for example, uh, dealing with it in addition to perhaps playing a role in some of the climate funds like the UN that you have suggested? Um, given the climate. Um, thank you for the question and if I understand it correctly and tell me if I've, if I've got it wrong and I get to the answer if I've misunderstood your question but look we've got work to do. I mean I, I, I choose to be optimistic um, because as I said in an earlier context it beats the alternative. Um, there are good things happening so we have 3.4 gigawatts more going into this summer than we had available going into <coughs> last summer. That's no small thing. AMO's connections approvals in the last financial year were 6.8 gigawatts compared to 4.2 the financial year before. That's a big lift. Um, and the pipeline is there, as you know, when we're talking about all the renewable energy investors who are looking at Australia. They've got a big pipeline. What I want to see is that develop into FID, which is where, at the moment, we haven't seen that much of it. Now, um, they all tell me they're sticking with it and they are moving to FID, and, you know, over the next two years we'll see improvements, um, but I want to see more of those. Now, again, what we can do, we can help de-risk in a competitive global environment. De-risking is very powerful. That's what the capacity investment scheme is designed to do and does. It is by very definition, I won't bore those who aren't interested in the finer details of it with how it works, but it's a, it basically says come and invest in Australia in renewable energy and we will give you uh, a guarantee about how you're going to go. Um, and it's been quite successful. Tomorrow I'll be uh, making further announcements about the New South Wales element of the capacity investment scheme and we're talking big megawatts. Um, and there's more work for the capacity investment scheme to do. And again, in some, and both at all levels of government too, have to think about how quickly we're moving and how we can facilitate. I mentioned the EPBC, a 20% increase. Good problem to be managing, but a problem in some senses. And similar with our EMO. We gave AEMO $3 million more for their connection because they have to prove the sort of electrical connections as, a, as opposed to the environmental approvals. And it is getting connections through faster. So that's a bit of a model as to what more we might be able to do um, uh, to, get, to get more of that very encouraging pipeline through to final investment decision. Chris, I'm going to ask you the last question. You mentioned the climate wars in your speech. 
Um, the climate wars didn't paint Australia in a good light. Uh, they didn't deliver a predictable policy framework that would encourage business investment. According to Lowy Institute polling, for the past six years, a clear majority of Australians have said that climate change is a serious and pressing problem. So I think most Australians want to believe that the climate wars are behind us. Can you give us some confidence and some reason for optimism for believing that? I wish I could give you more optimism on this particular matter, uh, Michael, I really do. And you're tempting me to be partisan, and I've tried pretty hard to be post-partisan tonight with one small breakout in my speech. But um, um, the climate wars, I think, are in retreat, but they're not yet over. The public are over. The climate wars of the public are over. You know, there's around 10% of the community who are climate change deniers. Uh, with all due respect to that view, it's not, a, it's not, I'm not going to convince anyone. If you're a climate change denier in 2023, Maybe I can be relatively persuasive on a good day, but I'm not going to convince you now. So that that part of the, the climate war is, is, is not over in terms of the, they are very loud, particularly social media. It's 10%, roughly all the polls show, maximum 15. Um, and you've got climate activists who are very passionate and I very much welcome that passion. You've got a whole bunch in the middle who believe climate change is real and it should be acted upon, providing it's in the economic best interest of the country. And that's where you know, we, we focus, frankly, our communications to remind and reassure people that it's in the best interest of the country. Even It's a moral obligation to future generations. It's a moral obligation to the rest of the world. Even if it wasn't, it would be a smart economic thing to do. That's where we have to focus our public attention to make sure that these people stay engaged in the transition and supportive of it. The problem is, frankly, at the political level, I work very closely with my state and territory colleagues. I've got a meeting in Perth in two days' time. Um, the majority of the state ministers are Labor. There's one Liberal and one Green. You would not know who's who if you walked in the room. Like We're all just getting on with it, getting on the task. So I give due credit. And that was the case in New South Wales under a Liberal government. It's the case with Tasmania. They're just getting on with it. It's not the case federally, to be frank. You know, um, there is not one piece of climate legislation or climate-related regulation that the federal opposition has supported in the last eight months. Not one. And so that means we, we, we have to do it without them. And frankly, I do not see that changing under current management arrangements in the Liberal Party. You know, the, the, I just don't, the, the leader of the opposition, I do not see him changing his spots. Might be different if things were different in the Liberal Party. There is a group in the Liberal Party in 2023, who are climate change deniers. You know, they're, they're very active. They don't, they don't to, I suppose, to their credit, they don't hide it. You know, they're, they're prolific. You know, you know, Senator Rennick is a senator of Australia who denies the climate science prolifically every day on social media. Um, the member for, for uh, Flynn is, is similar. Um, senator Canavan. You know, they just, there's enough of them to effectively veto climate progressive climate policy in the alternative government of Australia. So that until that changes, the climate wars aren't over. They're in retreat, but they're not over. And frankly, it increased, they, they, they are increasingly irrelevant group, but they're still there. So we've passed all the legislation, we've done everything without them. Um, but I've just got to call, as I said, I, I can think of no other way to answer your question other than to make that partisan, but I think accurate point. You know, I, I, it's not the way in the rest of the world. In the, in the United Kingdom, the Labor Party, the Tory Party and the Liberal Democrats basically have the same climate policy. You know, Labor Party is more ambitious, particularly, you know, in the very recent period. But, you know, the fundamentals are set. I met before the New Zealand election. I was in um, Wellington. I met with my friend, the minister. I met with the shadow minister. Shadow minister's position was extraordinarily progressive by Australian standards. You know, so um, there's no climate change denial that I encountered in the new New Zealand government, but I do encounter it in the alternative government in Australia. And frankly, it's gotten worse. You know, it's gotten worse since the May election, in my view. Um, things have gone backwards uh, in terms of the political engagement of the opposition in the challenge of our time. They're just not engaged at all. Um, sorry to be so pessimistic about that last point. I, I, to be very clear with you, if I thought there was a way of changing that under current management, I would. 
I would compromise, I would sit down with the opposition, I would say, listen, I, I've got a certain way of doing things, but I will compromise if it means bipartisanship because it will send the message to investors, doesn't matter who's in government, nothing's gonna change, you can invest here safely. It's not gonna work. Um, if it works one day, I'll be in like Flynn. I'll be, you know, in, in um, arguing for a bipartisan position for that certainty. But uh, I see very uh, little prospect of it in the foreseeable future. Well, I'm sorry to drag you back <laughs> from optimism to pessimism and from the commanding heights of the international economy to Canberra. But I do want to thank you, Chris, for coming tonight, for giving a very meaty speech, for answering our questions. I think nobody is in any doubt that the ministers in command of his brief took questions on all manner of um, all manner of issues. And I think everybody wishes the best of luck to you and all the delegates at the COP in the hope that you and your colleagues come up with meaningful policies and changes that help us to avoid dangerous global responsibility. It's a global warming, it's a big responsibility. So thank you for taking it on and thank you for giving us a preview into Australia's approach at the COP. Thank you, Chris Bowen. Thank you.